Hey folks, welcome back to the Wisdom Tradition Podcast. Once again, this is Alex Sacken, and today I'm going to be picking up in our ongoing series on Plato and his vision for the philosophic empire. And this is going to be part three of an overall six-part series. In the first episode, I said it was five parts, but I actually broke one of the episodes up into two parts. This is actually one of the episodes that was broken up. Anyway, uh, in today's episode, we're going to be looking at Plato's teachings about the world soul and the philosophy of archetypes. And this is really the first of the parts in this series and where we actually go into the substance of Plato's teachings. And the first two episodes before that were really setting the context. The first episode set a big picture historical context. And then the second episode really looked at Greece in the time of Plato and the characteristics of Greek culture. And that ended up concluding with a sort of intro to Plato. And so in this episode, we are going to be now examining Plato's concept of the world soul and his concept of archetypes. And then in the second part of this article, we're going to be looking at a case study of his idea or his concept of archetypes. And we're, look at, we're going to kind of uh, show how it works in practice by exploring humanity as an archetype. The idea that there's a divine archetype or a divine idea for mankind. And this divine idea incorporates the final evolutionary form that humanity is destined to evolve into. So the basic concept is that there is a law and a pattern to mankind's existence. And this law and pattern describes the evolution that we've undergone so far. And it also informs us as to where we're going in the future. <clears throat> and these are things that we're going to be looking at today through the lens of Plato's teachings and his concept of archetypes. So it's going to be a great episode. I'm going to begin things with a short preface. And then I'm going to jump into the first main section, which is called Plato's concept of the world soul and let's get to it all right let's do the preface first this article is the third in a six-part series on the lifetimes and teachings of plato the great philosopher and initiate of ancient athens it follows part two which introduced plato and his teachings by investigating the social cultural and philosophical influences that informed his worldview more specifically in these pages we will unpack in detail one of Plato's most important ideas, that of archetypes. Here, we not only discuss the philosophical meaning of the concept, but we also explore as a case study how the idea of archetypes relates to the topic of the human race and its origin, purpose, and destiny here on Earth. And that segues into our first section, which is Plato's concept of the world soul. In Platonic philosophy, the idea of the world soul is associated with the notion that behind the diverse hierarchies of life existing here on earth exists a single underlying unity or wholeness. So very simple, this idea I reinforce all the time that there's unity above and beyond diversity and this unity is the ruler, this unity is the God. Or in Plato's case, this unity is the world soul. Investigating the inner nature of this world soul, Plato found its unity to be partitioned into a trinity of foundational principles. Traditionally, these are called spirit, soul, and body, but in modern terminology, we might instead term them consciousness, mind, and form. Plato believed that this foundational trinity of principles, which together comprise the world soul as a unified entity, itself emerges out of a yet greater principle of unity, one that Plato terms the absolute. So the idea is that the world's soul is, this, is a trinity. So it's one thing broken into three parts, and the three parts are inseparable. But this one thing that is comprised of three parts itself emerges out of a yet greater concept of unity, and that's called the absolute. As Manley Hall explains, according to Plato, the absolute or unconditioned existence causes to emanate from itself what he termed the world soul. This soul is the life that is communicated to this world out of the immovable and immutable first principle. The apex principle of the world soul, the first principle in its triad, is what we now term consciousness, or what was traditionally termed spirit, but in modern language we call it consciousness, with the lower two principles of the triad, mind and form, emerging out of this initial condition. The world soul plays host to a single unified experience of self-consciousness. This divine self, which is the spirit of the world, forms the first principle of the Trinity. It, uh, meaning this first principle, then moves into creative expression via the second principle, 
which in modern language you would call mind. So mind is the agent that receives the inherently unconditioned power of consciousness and conditions it, thereby bringing it into a state suitable for creative expression. The creation that results from the mingling of these two principles, consciousness and mind, the father-mother principles of creation, this third factor is the world form. So in the language of system science, this world form exists as a super system. It's an all-encompassing wholeness. It is a grand universal form, a single wholeness that is internally comprised of a branching hierarchical network of systems within systems. So it's the one super system within it are many different systems at various levels of hierarchy, each existing as a miniature replica or microcosm of the super system as a whole, which is by association the macrocosm. Mind, this principle of mind, the second principle of the world soul's triad, serves as an intermediary agent that links unity and diversity, the whole and the parts, and consciousness and form. And consciousness in turn is the root principle behind mind, as it is from within consciousness that mind first emerges. Mind, once born from consciousness, specializes this consciousness into an experience of self-existence. This takes place by means of the creation of a universe of differentiated life forms, which together serve to provide a platform of experience for the one self to navigate itself within and through and to experience every aspect of. So the mind creates the world form for consciousness to move into and experience. At its apex, mind is joined with the unified consciousness of the divine self, while at its nadir, it is connected to each diverse life form existing within the material world. So the mind is this agent that uh, has one pole in spirit and the other pole in matter. At every level, mind is specializing and organizing consciousness into experiences of selfhood. This mind is operating according to a master blueprint that is held at its own apex, its own highest point, which is the point where it is conjoined with the root consciousness of the divine self, the first principle of the triad. And we can think of consciousness sort of uh, bringing creation into existence through an act of meditation and mind facilitates this meditation. Manly Hall, building off this pattern of thinking, informs us that, quote, the various phenomenon of life are of mental origin. The universe itself is a creation of mind. The laws of nature originate in the world of thought and are administered by cosmic intelligence. This is a Manly Hall quote. Living entities emerge within creation as thought forms of the divine mind. Each is designed according to the blueprint of the initial archetype that this mind initially conceives for the universe. So the divine idea behind creation is its archetype, and an archetype is a fundamental life pattern. Such a pattern or plan exists not only for the universe as a whole, but for each individual life form within it. The laws of the universe are derived from this initial archetype or thought pattern that the divine mind conceives. The various forms of life that are generated within creation must obey and follow the laws of this initial archetype. This archetype is stamped upon them at the most fundamental level. The design of their own souls is stamped with the, with, the, with the archetype. So there's no escaping this fundamental pattern that guides all things. The only thing that we can do is learn what the pattern is or the laws are and then obey these. And then by obeying them, we fulfill that archetypal pattern. That's the, the kind of the point. Moving into further detail, we find that the mind of the world soul inherently organizes its creation according to a septenary pattern of design. The seven primordial organizing principles behind creation are born directly out of the divine mind itself. Together, these become the gods, Elohim or Dhyani Buddhas i.e. the great creative powers behind the formation of the universe. The divine self, working through its principle of mind, gives birth to these gods out of its own unity. They become a spectrum of seven archetypal powers, which together synthesize to create a grand design or divine plan that the world soul evolves to embody in its cycle of creative expression. 
So the fundamental organizing pattern of the world soul is based on the septenary design. This is also an idea that we talked about extensively on this channel. Manley Hall elaborates on the meaning of the great gods behind creation. Quote, theologically speaking, creation is the formation of the tangible universe under the direction of cosmic or universal intelligences called gods. Actually, creation is the incarnation of the gods or supreme principles that build around themselves the world form. So the gods are really the expression of mind. So the one god is consciousness. The seven gods that come from the one god together constitute mind as a, as a creative uh, it's as its creative expression. So the creative output of mind comes as a septenary. This world soul manifests this septenary design across both space and time dimensions. The seven space dimensions referencing a septenary concept of metaphysics and the seven time dimensions referencing seven subcycles or ages taking place within one overarching master cycle. So seven cycles within one cycle and seven planes within one world soul. The septenary pattern moving into the world soul impresses itself incrementally upon each of the seven internal planes with the material world representing the seventh and lowest plane of this septenary pattern. So our world that we consider the whole of the universe is actually the least part of a universal system that expands outward further levels, further metaphysical levels actually beyond ours. And those metaphysical levels are just as, or even more important to the nature of reality than just this lowest physical plane. So in any case, that is the basics of Plato's concept of the world soul. So now in this next section, we're going to look at uh, Plato's concept of archetypes in further detail. All right, jumping into the next section, Plato's concept of archetypes. Within the world soul, the creation and destruction of material forms takes place according to law, implying that there is a deliberate pattern and purpose behind each birth and death that takes place within the world soul or within the universe. As Manley Hall teaches, quote, creation is the process of the objectification or manifestation of forms into temporary patterns and disintegration is their process of retiring from manifestation. Hall then describes a process whereby one supreme consciousness working through mind designs, organizes, and builds the world of material form. Quote, conscious activity working upon or brooding over matter creates form. The activity of life upon and through its substances curdles or organizes matter so that it assumes definite forms or bodies. These organisms, thus caused by bringing the elements of matter into intelligent and definite relationships, are held together by the conscious agent manipulating them, which is this idea of the self, the divine self. Essentially, Hall is describing universal creation to exist as a divine meditation of God. This God, in psychological terms, represents the single consciousness of a unified being or self which is working through a principle of mind in order to build a living, evolving world of material forms. This divine self first manifests its consciousness through an inner principle of mind. This power of mind then conceives and designs creation as a grand universal idea, which it then builds. In so doing, it brings an initial subjective idea for creation into objective expression as the universe of material forms we inhabit. In this way of thinking, one sees that, quote, the universe is not only alive, it is ensouled by a supreme principle, a principle which possesses within itself personality, but transcends it. A principle with mind, but beyond mind. A principle with all types of specializations within it, but transcending them all. This supreme principle seals all things with its own signature and sets forth the grand plan, the grand purpose, and the grand principle that is unfolding. That was Manley Hall. The entire creation process is guided by archetypal laws or archetypes which become law. Um, so the basis of law being archetypes. So the entire creation process is guided by these, which the divine mind adheres to at every step of the way and which it stamps onto material creation as its own signature, as Manley Hall was implying. 
In his writings, Manley Hall, the great platonic philosopher of 20th century America, further summarizes the role that archetypes play in creation. He notes that, quote, the platonic doctrine of ideas or archetypes postulates the unfoldment of life according to certain patterns, which are these archetypes, and these patterns are established in the divine mind. According to this doctrine, the processes of evolution are molding the universe into a likeness which has existed for uncounted ages in the universal consciousness. He continues, quote, every created thing in this material world shows an invisible organization, and this can only be a reflection of the infinite potential or archetype which brought it into existence. Therefore, space must also be structured and organized. It must be a series of manifestations under law and order. That was Manley Hall, and that was the end of that section. So I hope that helped illustrate and make clear more about how this idea of archetypes relates to the world soul and these principles of consciousness, mind, and form. Going deeper into the inner structure of the world soul and the role that archetypes play in organizing its creative expression, we may note that the principle of mind within the world soul playing host to the generation of material creation does so through a process of self-polarization. In order to generate material creation from within itself, the mind must first polarize itself into positive and negative poles of expression, one spiritual, the other material. The spiritual aspect of mind is formless and immaterial, while its inverse pole is involved with the organization of matter into physical form. Manley Hall, describing Plato's thinking, teaches that, quote, the world is divided into two hemispheres, of which the higher is the realm of principles and the lower the abode of embodied creatures. The mind extends across both dimensions, uniting the subjective or consciousness with the objective or material form. In this way, as Manley Hall informs us, quote, all things exist in two worlds, one of which is outward and visible and the other inward and invisible. The invisible, which is the idea, has stamped itself like a seal upon the face of manifested creation, which is the form. In other words, there is, quote, an invisible archetypal realm which impresses its likeness upon all its visible productions. The world around us is the symbol or signature of that realm, which can only be seen through inner vision. Plato, Pythagoras, and the Orphic mystics all viewed the superior incorporeal realm of the world soul as being one of pure intellect and archetypal idea. The archetypal plan for creation is conceived and held on this level, where it serves as the root idea for the world form, which is generated within the lower material realm of the world soul. The pure ideas or archetypes conceived originally by the divine mind are then projected by this mind into matter. As these archetypal thought patterns are projected into matter, they crystallize, forming bodies around them which restrict the idea's free flow of movement. In this perspective, we understand that the various forms of life within material creation are actually crystallizations of divine ideas originally conceived and held within the divine mind. These divine ideas are originally manifested through the seven powers or gods that this divine mind gives birth to. In other words, it is by means of these first principles or gods that the world form is generated. By implication, all manifest forms that arise in the universe do so as extensions of archetypal ideas or gods that are initially conceived and fashioned by the supreme intelligence of the universe. These transcendent archetypal ideas are not discoverable by man's sensory faculties. As they are unbodied, and as such cannot be revealed to the intellect as cognizable forms. Instead, they must be experienced mystically through an expansion of individual consciousness out into a transcendent state of universal awareness. According to this way of thinking, the world soul is the primary factor behind existence and the human soul a secondary factor that exists within it, a microcosm held within a larger macrocosm. Plato, quote, declared that each human being partook of this world soul, with the human soul being a part of its greater wholeness. 
The world soul plays host to the human soul, both individually and collectively. As the human soul evolves, it does so always in relation to the world soul. The world soul contains the archetype of the human race as part of its own intrinsic design. Therefore, the final destiny of mankind is already established within the mind of the world soul, where it has resided since the beginning of man's creation. In esoteric philosophy, mankind is considered a microcosm of the world soul. This means that man is collectively a miniature world unto itself, one designed according to the same principles of the greater macrocosm that contains it. As we covered above, the world soul is polarized between spiritual and material poles of expression, so mankind as the microcosm is similarly extended. The roots of man lie in the spiritual world, not the material one. Quote, man is a metaphysical being abiding in the superphysical worlds. He is revealed to our sense perceptions by the physical body, which is the least part of his composite nature. Like the world as a whole, the physical body of man is a vehicle for the manifestation of invisible spiritual energies. These energies not only sustain the body itself, but flow through it, manifesting as the attitudes, impulses, and functional processes of the outer life. That's Manly Hall. These energies are intellectual and moral in nature. They move according to the dictates of archetype. Bentley Hall writes that, quote, As they flow into the body, they mold the form into the likeness of themselves, and so establish the true causes of all the phenomenon of life. In ancient Sanskrit, the spiritual consciousness or the archetypal self, the divine self, existing at the root of the world soul, is termed the Vajrasattva, meaning the divine self. Humanity, like the world soul of which it is the microcosm, also possesses a divine principle at the root of itself. This archetypal human is traditionally termed the Manu, the ancient Hindu name for the divine human self, the archetypal human being. The Manu emerges as the complete idea for mankind, what it will look like at the final end of its evolution. In this way, it presents the human archetype, the seed idea for man generated within the mind of God. The Manu is conceived by the world soul or macrocosm to be a miniature image or microcosm of itself. In this way, through the person of the Manu, the world soul generates the mental embodiment of itself. So we have this contrast between the Vajrasaf or the divine self behind the world, and then we have the sort of focusing of the archetype of this divine self that it impresses upon the world, uh, the world soul, that archetype is then concentrated into the image of man in the form of a divine man, a perfect human being, the perfect idea of humanity. And that's what this idea of the Manu represents. The Manu represents, quote, the collective intellect of the entire human life wave. He is the one above the all, the whole above all parts the complete man, equivalent to the Gnostic Anthropos and the Kabbalistic Adam. The Manu represents human consciousness as a composite wholeness. He is the grand man, the one human life behind all individualized human lives. The Manu is also the human archetype. All subsequent life forms are based on his original pattern of being. Being a microcosm of the world soul, the Manu follows its lead and manifests itself through a septenary pattern of mental expression. This septenary pattern governs the organization of man in both its space and time dimensions. Spatially, man evolves through seven stages of evolutionary form, with each of these evolutionary forms termed a root race. Temporally, these seven root races are expressed across seven world ages, with each world age featuring its own unique root race. As the archetypal human being, meaning the complete, perfect, fully enlightened human, the Manu contains the archetypes for all seven root race forms within his consciousness. In the process of creation, these seven root races are manifested in sequential order and in seven sequential unfoldments of its own consciousness. So again, I, I talked about the world soul and these ideas of uh, an archetypal design to the world soul. 
as a preview to discussing the idea of the Manu, because all those patterns of the world soul are now reproduced within the Manu, including this idea of a division into a pattern of seven, which is what we're talking about here. And this division comes in multiple ways, but initially it comes through this idea of seven subsidiary Manus coming from one uh, complete Manu. So seven extensions of itself from one founding principle. And then those seven uh, subsidiary expressions of the one consciousness of the Manu become themselves the foundations for the seven root races or the, the seven evolutionary forms of mankind. Moving its consciousness stepwise through the vehicle of each of these seven root races, the Manu passes from one state of meditation to another until finally the meditation exercise is resolved and the Manu experiences the state of non-existence. During its seven cycled meditation, quote, that which is the internal experience of the Manu becomes the external experience of the root race, which has been conjured into existence by the Manu. In this way, the Manu enters into an experience of diversity within itself by meditating upon it. It contemplates the fact without becoming the fact. That's a Manly Hall quote. Before continuing, I want to pause and note an important implication of this discussion, that human evolution is predestined. It is divinely ordained to move sequentially through seven archetypal stages or root races, each building off and advancing the achievements of its previous ancestors. Manley Hall explains that at the beginning of a new root race, the racial Manu for that race will incarnate in order to establish the archetype for that race. Its seed will then be planted within the body of the previous root race. In time, from this original seed, a collective race of billions of people is gradually born into creation, each drawing upon the original archetype of their spiritual father, the racial Manu. So I hope you're seeing how this idea of the Manu fits beautifully and perfectly into this idea of archetypes. So as these billions of lives evolve, they do so always in relation to an archetypal end state that is already predestined to take place. Why? Because the father of the race, the racial Manu, already exists as the embodiment of the race's final evolutionary state. So when the race attains its final evolutionary state, the Manu behind the race actually awakens completely to its own existence, its own reality, which is the primal truth, is the one Manu, and the secondary truth is the many different expressions of that Manu. But once those many different expressions are all resolved into enlightenment, then actually what has happened is that the racial Manu has attained enlightenment. And actually what that means is that the Manu, the supreme Manu behind the racial Manus, uh, attains to a measure of enlightenment himself and that culminates at the end of the seven cycles uh, the seven root races with that one Manu containing its ultimate and complete enlightenment uh, which it does through all the various evolving forms that have emerged and all the various experiences and qualities of human life that have emerged since its meditation since its motion into creative activity in the beginning, the Manu plants his seed in the evolving body of man. Over the course of this age, this seed germinates and grows, eventually evolving into a fully mature expression of the pattern that was originally held within the initial germ that was planted. This is, again, just talking about arch how archetypes work. In this way, man is evolving to bring an evolutionary end state already laid out for it into objective realization within the material plane of the earth. Our destiny is driven by the need to fulfill this task. When it is completed, our purpose for existence is satisfied and we depart, making way for the next Manu to incarnate and fulfill its work through a new round of root races and evolving human souls. Manly Hall summarizes the point. Evolution is the fitting of a nature into its own archetype. By growth, we learn to become our essential selves, ordered after the precise image of our own divine prototype. In other words, quote, man reaches completion when he perfectly fills the mold or pattern that exists in the transcendental spheres. Taking this perspective, quote, our path is rendered plain. We are destined by eternal providence to become the fullness of ourselves. 
we shall find perfection in the consummation of the destiny for which we were first conceived. And this is, a, again, a, it's such an important point, I'm going to reemphasize it. Our path is rendered plain and we are destined by eternal providence to become the fullness of our own archetypal design. So by means of that, we shall find perfection in the consummation of the destiny for which we were first conceived. We were first conceived as an idea, as a divine idea. And so that ends that section. And now we're going to be moving on to the archetype of the world hero. So we've seen the archetype for humanity. Now we're going to look at the archetype for the human being who is evolving to become the fullness of itself. So a human who begins at a low point and ends at a high point. That's the world hero. As humanity evolves, it does so through a sequential pattern of development taking place across seven root races. Each of these root races is patterned after the archetypal design of a racial Manu, which itself is a projection of the single spiritual Manu, who is the single archetypal human self behind all races. In the process of meditating itself into an experience of diversity, the Manu first partitions its consciousness into the likeness of seven racial Manus, each a projection of itself. These emerge sequentially, becoming the archetypes for seven specialized modes of human consciousness or root races. This is a re recap in different words of what we went over, but we're going to be going into some more new. When one of the seven racial Manus moves to incarnate itself as a root race, it does so initially by projecting itself into seven subsidiary rishi or bodhisattvas, each embodying one of the Manu's seven soul powers or rays as they're uh, called by Alice Bailey. So you see the pattern reproduced here. So we have one ultimate Manu, seven racial Manus, and then from each of those seven racial Manus is emitted seven rishi or seven bodhisattvas, seven great uh, extensions of itself. The Manu, as the archetype of man, resides permanently in the spiritual plane of the world soul, where he remains in meditation. The seven Rishi that he projects his consciousness through serve as his intermediaries. They reveal and distribute his will within the lower body of evolving humanity. The Rishi are what the Buddhists term bodhisattvas. They represent, quote, an order of angels from a previous cycle of existence who guide humanity in its infancy. At the most remote ages, they actually incarnated as the demigods ruling over primitive humanity. These seven sages reincarnate in each world age, becoming the advisors and initiators of the new root race. The rishi of each age are therefore the continuous re-embodiments of one great line of teachers. These seven sages reincarnate in each world age each time in a new evolved racial form, thereby becoming the advisors and initiators of each of the root races. The Rishi of each age are therefore the continuous re-embodiments of one great line of teachers. In his book, Light of the Vedas, Manly Hall provides further detail about these archetypal humans who serve as the forefathers of the race. Hall writes that regarding our current race, which is said to be the fifth of seven total, the Manu who ensouls the race and bears it out of himself on the plane of mind is called in the ancient writings Vyasvata Manu. He elaborates, quote, the Manu of the fifth great race, the Aryan, is the mind of that race, its collective genius, as well as its individual potential. This great being who ensouls the race is called in the ancient writings Vyasvata Manu. He is the son of Vaivasa, or the son of the sun. Vyasvata Manu is the sun or great light source of the Aryas and the focus of a racial solar system. He is accompanied by seven Rishi who correspond on the racial plane to the planets. They are the revealers and distributors of his will. The presence of the Rishi or fathers, uh, as they are sometimes referred to, the, their presence serves as the early spiritual shepherds of man, 
of sort of primitive mankind. And this explains why highly advanced forms of knowledge and culture existed in very ancient times. The vast majority of, of ancient humans lived in a primitive state. Yet ancient civilization reached some incredible highs. Why? Because the cultural achievements or accomplishments of these early civilizations were achieved by a small group of mental giants who ruled over primitive mankind like shepherds to a flock. It was from their guiding hand that the foundations of civilizations were first brought to primitive kind, to primitive mankind. These were the gods who walked with men in the dawn of time, the old and wise ones that ancient myths tell us about. These spiritual fathers are bodhisattvas, great spiritual beings who had originally attained enlightenment as humans in a previous cycle of existence. Upon attaining enlightenment, these great souls refrained from entering the spiritual condition of parinirvana, which is sort of absorption into a universal state, and instead returned to material creation to become re-embodied as a line of great spiritual teachers in the subsequent age, or in a subsequent age. The Rishi returned to reincarnate on earth in order to serve as guides for the next cohort of souls scheduled to undergo a cycle of evolutionary advancement here on this material planet. Their task is to initiate mankind, to accelerate its evolutionary growth program so as to unlock and release its own inherent powers and potentials. The idea is that through initiation, man may one day evolve itself to the attainment of of their own lofty estate as perfectly evolved humans. These spiritual fathers incarnated in order to raise up and initiate the first cohort of spiritual leaders from the evolving human life wave. So this idea that the human pattern is in the cycle of creation, that there is an element of it that remains spiritual the whole time, that remains centered in spirit. And this is that, this idea of the Manu and the Rishi, and also, as we'll be discussing, the adepts. So those remain in a spiritual state of consciousness. And the adepts are also um, raised up from this lower realm that we're going to talk about in a second. So anyway, the adepts, the Rishi, and the Manu, these are all spiritual, divine human beings, levels of divine human beings. Now below that is a lower level of humanity and really that represents keeping in mind this idea that humanity is one great body that represents the sort of aspect of the manu that is still attached to something that it has to work through through the cycle of creation so it represents the idea of an aspect of the manu going unconscious in relation to the rest of the manu's consciousness so the manu's consciousness even though it remains complete and remains spiritual there's an aspect of itself that is it's deliberately projecting into matter and that it has to eventually bring back out of matter and only by bringing itself back out of matter does it become fully complete again is the it, the idea of its own existence becomes completed only once it it draws back into itself the mental extensions that it originally projected out so um, anyway, we're saying that these these Rishi or the fathers incarnated to raise up um, as Bodhisattvas, they come to raise up the first most advanced or most evolved souls that are that are sort of growing back into consciousness. It raises those first ones up to become like them. And so the, it's those adepts, as they're called that become the custodians eventually in time because they become the custodians of the lower bodies of mankind. Um, so in the language of esoteric philosophy, these spiritual leaders of the race are termed adepts or arhats. In ancient Greece, they were called the world heroes. Manley Hall explains that adepts quote, are human beings belonging to the present life wave who have by the extraordinary cultivation of their spiritual faculties and powers, become conscious instruments of the divine plan and they are also the natural teachers of unenlightened humanity they are said to dwell in retirement and frequently select remote places for their habitations they have their disciples whom they instruct and are masters of the esoteric arts and sciences associated with their religious philosophy 
The first cohort of adepts of the present Aryan root race were initially evolved from one of the sub races of the previous Atlantean root race. Select individuals from this Atlantean sub race were overshadowed by the Rishi of an incarnating racial Manu, Vivasvata Manu, as we mentioned before, and who personifies the archetype of the fifth or Aryan root race. Manley Hall explains the process whereby these first adepts were raised up by the Rishi who incarnated at the beginning of the race. Quote, selecting vehicles suitable for their purposes, the Rishi overshadowed or inspired advanced types which emerged from the racial compound. These became the poet sages who conversed with the immortals in the dawn of time and who received the instructions which were later to be organized as the scriptural writings of mankind. Upon their initiation by the greater Rishi who oversold them, this initial cohort of Aryan sages became the first humans to embody the archetype of the forthcoming Manu. Consequently, they became the first children of the new root race that the Manu is destined over the course of a vast cycle of activity to incarnate its consciousness through. Once raised up by the Rishi, these adepts serve as the terrestrial ambassadors of the Manu. They work to build out and fulfill his will, which is directed according to an archetypal plan or pattern originally conceived and held in the mind of God. This they accomplish through the means of a chosen institutional vehicle, the esoteric school. So that's the basic, basic pattern that we're looking at. We're looking at the relationship between a Manu, seven Rishis, and then a cohort of adepts, which are raised up by these Rishi. These adepts become the natural leaders of their fellow human brothers and sisters. So that's generally how we find extraordinary accomplishments by a very small few in very ancient times is because these, these few were under divine inspiration. Manley Hall explains the process whereby these first adepts were raised up by the Rishi who incarnated at the beginning of the race. I think I already went over that. In raising up this first class of world heroes or adepts, the Rishi utilized an inward method of communication, appearing to the first adepts not corporally, but through an inner mechanism within the psyche. More specifically, these spiritual teachers leveraged the human capacity for imagination in order to impress upon the psyches of certain receptive individuals uh, as what Manley Hall describes as a series of intuitional aspirational overtones. By oversouling the psyches of a select cohort of human priests and holy men by means of their auras, these fathers enabled the individual to have an aura of consciousness greater than his natural state. In this way, select individuals were granted the power to experience inwardly through a psychic vehicle loaned to him by the next wave of life beyond himself. This allowed for powers of insight to develop and for visions to be had beyond that which would normally be accessible to a human soul of the previous root race. Through this mechanism, the fathers, quote, bestowed a vision of causes temporarily upon certain persons. These individuals, thereby participating in an experience, communicated it to others. This began a great system of instruction that was called intuitive or inspirational but was actually due to the imposition of the consciousness of the fathers between the individual and the higher planes, which you could no longer reach. So this is important. That explains how it happened. The mechanism is this idea of, of aura and an overshadowing of your or an individual's sort of aura that's incomplete and still building itself out. It becomes overshadowed by a completed aura of a fully evolved human, which is what these Rishi represent. So anyway, that's the end of that section. The next one is called the archetype of the esoteric schools. So we talked about the making of the adept and the adept in turn becomes the archetypal hierophant or high priest of the esoteric school. And through the esoteric school, 
the the Manu and the Rishi and their, their sort of plan for the archetypal evolution of the root race, that becomes enthroned within the esoteric schools through the adepts. And then through the esoteric schools in their lower grades, the initiates and their disciples, those plans, that pattern and purpose for this current root race uh, is brought into fruition. So the esoteric school becomes the custodian and the leader of the lower institutions and the lower social body and collective body of the human race. All right, picking back up, the next section is called the archetype of the esoteric schools. As described above, the first generation of adepts or world heroes were born out of a process of divine ensoulment by the Manu and his Rishi, who serve as the seed archetypes of the root race. Once born, these adepts serve as intermediaries between the higher spiritual orders of humanity and the four lower castes comprising the outer body of society, which they are responsible for raising and initiating. This they accomplish by means of their chosen institutional vehicle, the esoteric schools. The experiential knowledge attained by these first adepts through the esoteric means of instruction described above by means of the Rishi was translated into a body of wisdom teachings that could be communicated to the outer body of mankind so as to inspire them to evolve toward the archetype of the Manu. Through this method, the wisdom teachings of the Aryan root race were first revealed to man. Around these teachings grew a specialized institution to house them. In its initial form, this institution was called the Institutes of Manu. Later, it was called the Mystery Schools, and now we call it Esoteric Philosophy. The revealed knowledge of the Rishi becomes the foundation of their esoteric schools, which the adepts and their initiates preside over. The body of wisdom teachings taught in these schools is based on the archetype of the racial Manu, who resides in the spiritual world, where he projects his consciousness through the body of the evolving root race, that is to grow and evolve over the course of a new world age. So in short, the adepts serve as the terrestrial custodians of the root race's collective evolution. As Manley Hall explains, it is the duty of the adepts to clothe the eternal truth in parables and fables and to restate the doctrine on the levels of available understanding. This they accomplish through the various degree programs of the esoteric schools. Hall further teaches that, quote, the adepts are required by the law of the Manu to guide the race without interfering with the right of the human being to learn through experience. The adepts must therefore keep the universal laws and are servants rather than masters of the great plan. He continues, writing that the adepts wait in silent meditation to be discovered by those who deserve instruction and are willing to earn the right of growth through personal consecration and endeavor. Man grows by merit and not by virtues thrust upon him. Manley Hall is implying here that the adepts view earth as a great schoolhouse of the mysteries, one where human souls come to evolve upward toward the light. It is not the place of the adepts to force this growth, but rather to quietly encourage and catalyze it within the lower castes thereby driving the long-term evolution of the whole. Still, the human souls evolving through the lower terrestrial planes of the world soul must work out the negative karma that keeps them attached to the cycle of mortal existence here on earth. The adepts cannot take this away from them. Mankind must liberate itself from its own bondage to materiality. When souls grow tired of the darkness and begin to seek the light, the adepts in their schools are there to offer the path. Until then, man has a right to experience and learn from his own suffering so long as he chooses the ways of ignorance over wisdom. As Manley Hall explains, quote, The work of the great school is to acquaint the divine power locked in the illusion with its own self-appointed way of liberation. This is accomplished by the orders of creation themselves conquering gradually by inner strength the dream appearances that bind them to the wheel of birth and death. So that's the end of that section. And I think there's a lot of important information there that has to do with 
both the function of the esoteric schools, the hierarchy that controls those schools, and the purpose and reason for their existence. And furthermore, it explains why these schools are invisible and don't ex uh, impress their superiority over the lower body of man to force the growth of this lower body. Because in their religion, in their spiritual perspective, these esoteric schools, they believe that it is our responsibility to evolve ourselves. But they're also not hands off. Their approach is to, in various ways, catalyze this growth by sort of purposely evolving the institutions and working to evolve the institutions that are sort of bringing into order and organization this lower body of man. So anyway, I think that's an important section and uh, it kind of gets to the heart of this idea of how the archetype of the human being impresses itself on the world uh, through incremental stages. Um, now we're gonna get to the final section of this uh, current article and it's going to be called The Institutes of Manu and the Archetype of Philosophy. In the esoteric teachings, we are currently in the fifth age of the seven age world cycle. The previous age is termed Atlantis and the current age is termed the Arya. The Aryan age is patterned after the archetype of the racial Manu, Vaivasvata Manu, who first incarnated through his seven Rishi at a very remote age, perhaps as far back as a million years ago during the heyday of Atlantis, implying that the two root races overlap to varying degrees over a long period of time. Manley Hall elaborates, noting that the Rishi who first brought the teachings of the law, quote, lived in antediluvian times, meaning during the Atlantean age, bringing to man the divine wisdom from the previous worlds and previous rounds of evolution. Hall notes that the birth of the new root race that resulted from this revelation of wisdom, quote, was made over a million years ago, while the Aryans still dwelt together in the high plateaus of the Himalaya mountains. That's what Manley Hall says. He continues, noting that, Quote, the original Aryans were of Atlantean stock, probably descending from the old Semite branch of the Atlantean racial distribution. The differentiation occurred when Vivasvata Manu overshadowed or ensouled one of the old clans or brood families, ordaining that it should become the vehicle of a new race. Manly Hall explains that, quote, in proper usage, the word Arya means holy. The Aryans are the sanctified or those set apart to accomplish adepthood through the disciplines revealed by the Rishi. So now we're getting to the root of the word Aryan, which is a word that most people know through how it was misused in the 20th century by the Germans, uh, or more specifically the SS, which is the sort of occult inner sanctum of the Nazi party. But again, they misused the word. They were basically trying to stitch together a cosmology, a spiritual cosmology to, ju cosmology to justify pre-existing beliefs and to justify the research programs into sort of occult science that they were working on. And a part of that path was to investigate this idea that we're talking about the Arya, but then to co-opt it, implying that somehow it meant that the destiny of the age is is for a ethnicity to rule and that's wrong because the 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 root function of race is not physical it's psychological and it's a collective psychological institutional pattern and all people are destined to be incorporated into it so anyway getting back to the word aria it's it's indicating a caste of teachers and later on, this caste would be called the Brahmins. And you could say the Buddhists were extensions of it. The Greek philosophers were extensions of it. Anybody who carries forth this tradition that was first revealed a million years ago, as Manley Hall was saying, during the pre-Diluvian age, anybody who carries forth that tradition and brings it into life in their lives and in the communities that they're working in is... Uh, sort of carrying on this tradition of the Arya, and it has nothing to do with what race you are. So more specifically, the Aryans were the original caste of Brahmins, the caste of priests and prophets who carried forth the archetypal teachings and social plan first specified by the Manu, who is the father of the race. The present root race is traditionally termed Aryan after this original caste of teachers 
who first migrated down from the mountains of North Asia to spread the wisdom teachings of the Manu. And this they accomplished by establishing esoteric schools in key geographic and cultural zones across the earth. Here we discover that the word Aryan references a lineage of spiritual teachers rather than an ethnicity, as I was just saying. This cast of teachers migrated from their original birthplace in the Himalayan region of North Asia and carried forth an archetypal pattern of religious, scientific, and philosophical institutions across the world, seeding them into civilization zones all around uh, the earth over the course of numerous overlapping waves or migrations. The institutions these Aryan teachers carried forth into the world were first bestowed to them through the incarnation of the Manu, the racial Manu and his Rishi, and by the adepts who first revealed this tradition to them. So the, the Manu raised the Rishi, the Rishi raised the adepts, and then through the esoteric school, the adepts reveal the knowledge and embody the knowledge. It is the function of the Aryan caste of teachers to see the institutes of Manu worldwide spreading its body of archetypal wisdom teachings into all realms of the human kingdom, high and low, far and wide. The purpose of the Aryan wisdom teachings, which are embodied in what we now call the esoteric schools, is to translate the sacred teachings of the Rishi into a form suitable for all humans within the world civilization, or within world civilization, meeting each at the level they are currently existing at and elevating them to a higher plane. In this way, the um, adepts in their schools work to bring the vehicle of salvation, the doctrine of the Manu, to all peoples, thereby quickening the overall evolutionary process of the collective as a result. The revealed teachings of the law that the Rishi first brought to the Aryan adepts would be seeded by these adepts into society through their chosen institutional vehicle, the esoteric schools. In their original form, these were called the Institutes of Manu. Later, they would be called the mystery schools or esoteric schools. As Hall summarizes, quote, The ancient wisdom is the body of occult knowledge that has descended from the remote beginning of civilization to the present time. Occult philosophy teaches that the ancient wisdom was entrusted to the keeping of certain of the most highly evolved priests of the ancient world. These priests, as custodians of the secrets of life, set about to accomplish the gradual education of the human race. The average man, then as now, was unable to receive the more profound aspects of this knowledge. Therefore, simpler doctrines were devised to meet the needs of the unenlightened, and the more profound truths were reserved for the advanced types of humanity. Hall then continues, quote, The mystery schools were the guardians of the ancient wisdom, and were, for the most part, founded by initiate priest philosophers who had received the esoteric wisdom from the demigods of the first ages. These are, these are the rishis. Um, so in the mysteries, candidates were tested as to their strength of character, their courage, their integrity, and their intelligence. The initiations given in the old mystery schools were trials of spiritual, mental, and physical strength. Those who passed the initiation satisfactorily were accepted into the body of the priesthood and were instructed in the secrets of the ancient wisdom. So he's summarizing right there almost everything that I was just talking about in terms of the role of the esoteric schools, the preservation of wisdom, uh, the source of the wisdom as, as a type of revealed knowledge, and how um, those in the outer body of society are gradually raised up through the esoteric schools to receive this wisdom. But you can only elevate in those schools to the degree that you're also able to embody that wisdom incrementally. And then final graduation comes when you become an adept. From their modus times, Aryan missionaries have periodically moved out from their homeland to spread the Dharma or teachings of the law around the world, gradually transforming the institutional architecture of the world in the process. This conquest is not done through force. Rather, it is achieved through teaching, healing, political reformation, economic development, and institution building. The Arya extends its reach not by destroying civilizations by force, but by progressing and evolving the cultures and peoples it encounters. Its missionaries were simultaneously spiritual teachers, institutional reformers, and social progressives. The migrations of Buddhism across Asia serve as a good case study for how these Aryan migrations took place. Manley Hall describes the Buddhist method of dissemination. Quote, 
The Buddhist priests never gained their influence through war or conquest or enforced submission. When they entered a new community, always by invitation, they went quietly about their normal way. First, they built their little shrine and usually a library to house the scriptures they brought with them. Then they went to the countryside as servants of all in need. They treated the sick, solved the problems natural to provincial living, and then returned to their monastic house. By degrees, they won respect and confidence, not by their words, which often could not be understood, but by their actions, which spoke a universal language of charity and benevolence. The Aryan missionaries worked according to a spirit of synthesis, not coercion. They conquered through adaptation by taking what was old and worn out and transmuting it into something new and vital. Manley Hall explains, quote, in the process of introducing their beliefs among foreign nations, the missionaries of Buddhism searched for and emphasized the compatible elements abounding in other faiths. Here, the emphasis was upon principles rather than on personalities or sectarian distinctions. So what they did is they basically, it's like we talked about in the previous uh, section on the Orphic Mysteries uh, from the previous episode. This has to do with this idea that the Aryans came into a primitive Greece and surveyed the existing state of psychology and the mythology and the social structure. And then they went to work not to replace that original mythological structure, but to revamp it and revitalize it and redesign it so that in the end, the symbols of the old tradition are rearranged into a form that actually express the main ideas of this Aryan dissemination, this Aryan wisdom teaching tradition. So this happens again and again all over the world. And really the axial age, uh, the philosophers and the schools that emerged, these are all examples of this pattern of the Aryan migrations and the types of reforms that they set about um, implementing across the world. So in sum, the Arya in general and Buddhism in particular expanded its dominion by reforming already existing cultural institutions into new patterns, ones that embody the archetype of the original Aryan wisdom teachings. The mindset they cultivated in the populations they encountered was profoundly psychological, as Manley Hall uh, informs us, reinterpreting on the planes of mind and consciousness that which was earlier accepted either literally or as a purely spiritual abstraction. So as I was saying, here, here we return to the story of the Orphic Mysteries in Greece. The line of teachers collectively termed Orpheus, who first brought the wisdom teachings into Greece, came as missionaries of this Aryan motion. With the coming of the Orphics, the cycle of the Arya moved into the Mediterranean region and planted its seeds. These seeds would in time blossom in the form of Pythagoras and Plato, who carried forth its tradition by further seeding its wisdom teachings into the doctrines and schools of philosophy that they would found. Through this method, Philosophy was purposefully created to become the chosen vehicle for the esoteric schools and the new world age that was to come. Both Plato and Pythagoras were ambassadors of the Arya, restating and revitalizing the doctrine of wisdom teachings first brought forth by the Vaivasvata Manu and his Rishi long ago. At the appointed time, they emerged alongside a global cohort of other Aryan adepts in order to give birth to philosophy as a public-facing institution, one that had previously been held exclusively within the womb of the ancient mystery schools and the priesthoods who governed them. Together, these great fathers of philosophy, the Aryan adepts of the Axial Age, revealed one common tradition of wisdom teachings in the context of different cultures, languages, and mythological traditions. As Manley Hall elaborates, quote, the religions and philosophies of mankind are extensions of one parent system and not spontaneous generations in different times and places. Interpretations may differ, but that which is interpreted is without difference in substance and differs only in degree. Each of the great philosophical schools that emerged during the Axial Age, Plato and Pythagoras included, repackaged the sacred wisdom teachings of the Arya in a form and pattern appropriate to the people and culture that they were working with. 
Each philosophical school that the great Aryan adepts founded during the Axial Age, from Greece to Mesopotamia and Persia to India and China, imitated in its organizational design the two-tiered architecture of the mystery schools with an outer or exoteric body of teachings offered to the laity and an esoteric or inner body of tantric teachings offered to the most dedicated and deserving students. The Manu, as the archetype of man, specifies the program of teachings offered in the philosophical schools or the mystery schools. This is why the original esoteric school was called the Institutes of Manu. It describes a school based around the idea that all human laws are derived from the original life pattern of the Manu, the archetypal human. It is the goal of all philosophical students to learn the framework of archetypal laws that the Manu, Rishi, and adepts embody on their own level so that we may ourselves also align with this archetype and manifest its design perfectly within the pattern of our own souls. So that is the end of that section, also the end of this article. And once again, that section was titled The Institutes of Manu and the Archetype of Philosophy. And uh, once again, the sort of goal of this second half of the article, after we initially introduced Plato's idea of archetypes, was to apply it to the human race and see how it fits into that pattern. So with that there, I tried to cover how it starts with the Manu, then moves into the Rishis, then moves to the Adepts, the esoteric schools, and then out into the outer body of mankind. And the whole thing is sort of governed by this idea of there being an archetypal pattern, a sort of plan for the cycle of creation, but also there's an end state or destiny that the whole thing is being pulled towards. And... Um, so with that said, we're going to end this article, and then in the next one, we're going to pick back up, and we're going to be looking at, um, and actually further applying this idea of archetypes, we're going to be looking at Plato's teachings of Atlantis, and we're going to be considering how Atlantis tells us something about the ar archetype of a sort of behavioral pattern associated with empire, and how throughout history, this pattern becomes impressed or, re or repeated over and over again, as a type of karma, a type of repeated karma that we have yet, not yet overcome. So that's the theme of that. And so you can see there in that description, I'm kind of trying to bring together these initial uh, parts of this chapter that we're talking about history and empires. And now in this section, we talked about archetypes, finally getting into the substance of Plato's teachings. And now in that next section, we're going to be trying to synthesizing them and looking at history and this idea of archetypes and bringing them together to show how these patterns have a type of plan and design for them. And that sort of human suffering is ultimately serving a sort of spiritual purpose and is not a, a uh, sort of indicative of a cruel and different you know, universe. So anyway, those are the, the ideas that we're we'll working with in the next um, section. And I hope you'll uh, come back and tune in for that. So thank you very much and God bless.